CNN's Chris Cuomo defending the political advice he gave his brother Andrew, New York's governor, accused of inappropriate behavior or sexual harassment by at least nine women. I understand why that was a problem for CNN. It will not happen again. It was a mistake. But the younger Cuomo conceding that when it comes to his brother, he is biased. I can be objective about just about any topic, but not about my family. Less than two months ago, Chris Cuomo promised his viewers to be straight with them. I cannot cover it because he is my brother. While he avoided the story on the air, off camera, he was involved. This morning, the governor's office confirming what the Washington Post first reported, that Chris Cuomo joined strategy calls with the governor's aides about how to respond to the scandal. Did Chris Cuomo do more than just listen on these calls? Yes, Chris Cuomo gave uh, a lot of advice on these calls. He struck a fairly pugilistic tone, telling his brother uh, to not resign, uh, to push back against the allegations, so to not give in to quote-unquote cancel culture. Asked about the reports, the governor's office describes Chris Cuomo's role as a few phone conversations with friends and advisors, giving the governor advice. That influence from his brother, according to the Washington Post, apparent in the governor's defiant response. It didn't do anything wrong. Governor Cuomo has denied the harassment allegations and refused calls to step down. He's also apologized for making anyone uncomfortable. Women have accused the governor of everything from making inappropriate remarks to groping to unwanted kisses. This morning, Chris Cuomo insists he never influenced CNN's coverage of his brother. In a statement, CNN says it was inappropriate for Chris to be on those calls, which Chris acknowledges he will not participate in such conversations going forward. I love my brother. I love my family. I love my job. And I love and respect my colleagues here at CNN. And again, to them, I am truly sorry. And this morning, CNN says Chris Cuomo will not be disciplined for his role in crafting his brother's political defense. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our session on loyalty and conflict of interest. I played that video precisely to prime you for today's session on how journalists have got to choose in some cases between competing interests as was discussed a couple of weeks ago in terms of their fidelity to their jobs, to their relatives in some cases, and to their companies. And so in the case of Chris Cuomo, he is no longer with CNN. I should let you know that for those of you who may not be aware, um, the incidents around his coverage have really, you know, been a part of, you know, taking him to task. And so quite a few issues have occurred, not just around the Cuomo issue, but around other journalists in terms of their friendships and their loyalty and fidelity when it comes to how they cover stories. And so we're now going to go into loyalty and conflict of interest. Now, if you've done your required reading, you will see that loyalty and conflict of interest really emerged as a real issue that precipitated this particular case from page 98 to 201. And really we see that loyalty is rooted in the Grecian Phaedo or divine truths. By definition, it is a willing and thorough devotion of a person to another person or cause. And so you will see that in some cases, we may be loyal to someone or we may be loyal to a cause. We may believe whatever it is we want to believe or a cause. In some cases, those persons are, you know, very, very strong believers in, you know, taking their own lives. Um, they're, you know, believers of, of, of a cause that has to do with when I die, I'm dying for, for really divine purposes and stuff like that. And other faiths and other religions as well, people who will fast to their causes. And so they're very, very um, loyal to those particular causes. Now, in Hobbes' view, if you look at the reading, you will see that Hobbes considers loyalty as a social act to the crown, meaning that for those who vow or who are loyal to those who are in power in terms of the Crown, whether it's a king or a queen, um, for Hobbes, it's really a social act. And so he says that multiple loyalties could exist at the same time, but loyalty has limits. And so our loyalty ceases when we die. 
Now, for the theologian, Josiah Royce, he has, you know, this theologian has different views in terms of loyalty. And jo Royce actually says that loyalty is the single guiding principle. It's a social act, um, meaning devotion to a person or a cause, but it's an act of choice, according to Royce, and it basically promotes self-realization, meaning that when you make that choice, you, 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 you experience a great life in terms of what it is you would like to do in the context of making that particular choice. And so when it comes to what the theologian actually believes in, in terms of our choice, it aligns really well with what Hobbes' views are in terms of loyalty being a social act. Now, loyalty can be biased. That's one of the core issues. You will have a bias or reporters will face a bias because they will have to take one side or another because they're competing loyalties. It is fading away as a face-to-face -face practice because in many instances, on the spot, reporters will say, well, my loyalty is actually to my job and not to the people. And so this is the reason why it is fading away because we're living in an increasing or a partisan era where um, you know, loyalty is actually to whoever is paying the salary rather than the profession itself. And so it presents an ethical dilemma in unethical causes when it comes to the practice of journalists. And you will see in the case of Chris Cuomo exactly what happened in terms of trying to protect his brother who was the governor of the state of New York at that particular time. Now, competing interests in terms of journalists, you will see that they have competing interests and values that are aligned to country, democracy, town, employer, the profession itself, to themselves because they may have a following to their sources, to their family members and friends and as well, you know, this whole notion of a larger notion of truth and what they believe in, that might be a part of the mix in terms of their interests. Now, some consequences, conflicts of interest in news where the reporting versus interests of friends and family, and I can't help but bring back the example of the, the Cuomo brothers. You know, is it newsworthy to report at that time in his head, in Chris's mind, should I report on this issue because I think, you know, it is some sort of witch hunt, as they usually say, because my brother is uh, the governor and it's a, 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 you're living in a Me Too culture. Should I report on it as a newsworthy issue or should I try to help him and to reframe the story so that it, it appears to be a witch hunt? Um, should I report it from the context of my family's interests rather than the interests of the people in terms of it being newsworthy. And we know that issues around persons who, have, who are um, the public figures, such as a governor, it will create a stir, it will create a lot of heightened interest. And so it's this whole notion of towing that line between the competing interests that he has had to deal with, and I'm sure other reporters have had to deal with in the past in terms of recusing themselves from issues pertaining to family members and friends. Now, sometimes these competing loyalties lead to, for example, what should a reporter do when faced with a story that's newsworthy, but might cause negative consequences for a friend or a family member. Should a reporter's loyalty be his or her profession or to the friend or family member? Another question that they may ask themselves or we should be asking is, should reporters be allowed in the first instance to cover stories that might involve friends or family? And in the video at the opening of this lecture, you would note that Chris Cuomo apologized and he said it would not happen. CNN did not necessarily take action immediately, but eventually he was let go. All right. And so for today's case study, we must ask ourselves, how close should a reporter be allowed to get with potential news sources, especially when that news source is a family member or if you're getting close to the news sources, that may have some incriminating evidence against your family member and you're trying to muzzle those particular news sources. Now, as most journalists live and work in the community, they cover some real or perceived conflicts may be unavoidable. In the Schengen loose case, uh, pages 124 to 127, you will see that everyone knew who the reporter in this particular instance, and the reporter was very close to the police officer who had actually um, become the spokesperson. And so the stories and how she would have gotten the stories would have been sort of like a competing interest there because this is someone who's been covering crime. But then again, the person who's actually telling 
issues to the reporter as the spokesperson, she's in direct relationship with that person. And so for some stories, you know, it may affect everyone, including journalists. Um, those stories may have the possibility of being in conflicts of interest that cannot be violated. But when those particular cases arise, journalists and managers can ask themselves together the following questions about if and how they will re reveal the conflicts to the public. And we know that in this particular case, today's case, she did reveal her, her relationship with the police person. And so the question is, when and how will you disclose personal connections that could result in perceptions of conflict of interest, even if managers have decided the reporter is able to cover a story? Um, there's a series called, um, that I've been watching for the last few weeks, it's called um, Covert Affairs. And so they've had her go into the, the particular spaces um, as a covert operator, but in many cases, in some of the instances, she has, she has gotten very close to those persons that she's actually um, investigating. And so in some cases, she's torn conflictually between telling the person or revealing who she really is and actually investigating them and bringing them to justice as a CIA operative. So it's this whole notion of when and how will you disclose as a reporter your personal connections um, in terms of how conflicts of interest and perceptions about conflicts of interest could emerge even if the managers decide if you're the best person for the job, like you need to say to your editor one day, I don't think that I'm the best person for the job. I know that I'm your star reporter, I'm your star presenter or producer, but I have a relationship with that particular person who is going to be reported on in my community. I've been covering the community, but this particular instance here, I would like for you to excuse me because there's going to be a conflict. I'm unable to report objectively as a result of my relationship with the person. The question is the when and the how. Very early, I would say as soon as you're assigned to the case, then that disclosure should actually be made. And the question is, what if those connections are of a very personal nature? Like I said, it's of a personal nature. You've been to school with the person, your you know, personal friends, then it's of a personal nature. And there is where the managers must decide what information the public deserves so that audience members can make their own some decisions about whether conflicts of interest exist, all right? If it's a friend of a friend, then it's not necessarily as deep as if it's a direct relationship with that person who's actually being reported on. Now, let's talk about the Potter's box for a minute. And this was developed by ethicist Ralph Potter. And Potter suggests four steps for analyzing an ethical dilemma. Again, if you look into your media ethics issues and cases, you will see these particular issues here, these suggestions outlined in your reading. Now, what you know, the ethicist is actually saying is that, first of all, the reporter should strive to understand the facts of the issue in making that ethical decision. Next, the reporter should outline the values inherent in the decision. This means identify every single person's point of view. Weeks ago, we spoke about that, having that conversation, the what ifs and how do people um, gauge the story? Should they know the story? Do they have a right to know, need to know, want to know the alternatives? What if I carry the story in this angle? Is it going to result in harm to anyone in the community? So understanding the facts and outlining the values in the decision that is taken ethically this means that every single side has got to be told to strike that balance in the story. The third consideration is to apply relevant philosophical principles. Of course, you can use a code of ethics in this particular step, whether it's the Society for Professional Journalists or the RTBMA guidelines in terms of truthfulness and the whole need to minimize harm in the case of the Society for Professional Journalists. What you will see across all of the ethical guidelines that striving for the truth it's that particular hallmark. It's that particular gold star for every single person who is working in media, all right? So all of the philosophical principles that are relevant within the codes of ethics in terms of responsibility to the people, not just the truth, but minimizing harm as well, they have to be considered as part of the Potter's box. And then it's the whole need to articulate a loyalty meaning Make a decision based on whose point of view is most important. Is the point of view of the person you're reporting on most important or is the point of view of the state most important? These have got to be made 
in relation to what is happening, all right? Now, the RTDNA guidelines, I believe I would have touched on this before. This has to do with professional electronic journalists. They need to present the truth with integrity and decency, avoiding real or perceived conflict of interest with respect to the dignity and intelligence of the audience, as well as the subjects of the news. This means that every single person who's been reported on should have some sort of, I would say, integrity, and they should have some decency, and there should be some protection for that particular person as it relates to how they're represented in the news. Whether they're a CEO or whether they're a peasant, they should all be granted some level of, I would say, respect and dignity in relation to their stories. The RTDNA Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct specifically cites the need for avoiding conflicts of interest whether real or perceived. And so the act of reporting and presenting the news often puts journalists in the position of working very closely with sources. And this is where conflict of interest can actually occur. And so electronic journalists have an obligation to carry out their jobs in their, and their private lives with no real or apparent conflicts of interest. Now, the guidelines also strongly encourages journalists to ask the following questions when covering stories or beats that may produce a real or, or perceived conflict of interest. The first one has to do with, will the private actions of a journalist with a news source or newsmaker give the appearance of an unprofessional connection with that particular source? And so audience members may react with suspicion to revelations of friendships if it is that they are not divulged before, all right? There may be you know, deemed, you know, inimical to objectivity. And so there's a romance that is developing between journalists and their sources. There's going to be a problem for that person to carry that particular story. And of course, journalists and their managers, they really need to realize that relationships would be perfectly acceptable between other adults. It might not be viewed in the same way when it's a journalist and a source relationship. So these boundaries cannot be blurred when it comes to actually thinking through this whole notion of covering stories that may produce real or perceived, perceived rather conflicts of interest. So divulging, revealing, and considering those relationships and how they may be perceived by the public, these are very, very critical considerations in the context of the RTDNA guidelines in terms of covering stories or beats. Another question, will the actions of a journalist or newsroom managers, family members with a news source or newsmaker give the appearance of an unprofessional connection. We come back to the Kuoma brothers and that particular issue of the appearance of an unprofessional connection. And this is exactly what was being alleged in the case of Chris Kuoma grabbing the sources and trying to make sure that he outs them before the allegations to further incriminate his brother who was the governor at the time. In the same way, personal actions of journalists on their private time may come into question because if they're drinking and they're at a bar and they're seen in the company of those persons who are really, um, you know, family members who are under investigation or whatever the case may be, um, they're not deemed to be private figures. You know, you're not on your private time, but will those actions, you know, be perceived by audience members as being leading or biased or conflicting? If there's an ongoing case that is occurring where that person is concerned, if you're seeing, you know, you're seen out socially, then it may be deemed as unacceptable. And then the question uh, of whether it's ever acceptable to accept gifts from a source of a story, um, these are questions that have also got to be asked very clearly as part of the guidelines. Now let's look at the FCC rules. The Federal Communications Commission called for a specific disclosure of payment to ear material. Uh, but the question is, what if the gifts come not in connection with hearing specific content and what other motivation might there be for the gift? And so we've got to consider the appearances and how they have created the whole notion of what the audience believes the gifts were actually for in terms of the intent and the public disclosure or lack thereof. And so the question is, will you let the public know or would you divulge before the public if um, you know the gift was actually given on the nature of the gift so that you can limit the um, tendency of, 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 of for assumptions to be um, you know dispelled or, or to be mated out against your establishment. So because of the FCC rules, there has to be specific 
um, there have to be specific disclosure of payment to, to actually air material. And this hasn't got to do with those political ads because stations have got to, in some cases, maintain themselves. And invariably, um, there has to be balance in terms of bringing both sides of the political divide and airing their ads, their campaign ads, when it comes to the election cycle. Our next question is, will you accept free admission to parks or events you are covering, even when the general public must pay for the same access? Some ethicists insist that journalists covering events uh, requiring a ticket should pay the same fee, while others insist free access is part of the coverage. Now, managers, it's within their remit to discuss what sorts of events merit free access, and if any, do not, because invariably, if you do receive the free access, you will be required to cover that particular issue. In some cases, there may be the expectation of slant on the part of those who have given you free access. As a journalist, years ago, I recall having a press pass, and so that gave me access to almost any and every event, but really and truly, uh, there was not the whole pressure to write in a certain way or report in a certain way as a television journalist. But what it required was some sort of, um, I would say, responsibility on the part of what lens are you going into that particular event with and what expectation are you creating as a result of the freebie um, for that particular concert ticket, uh, so to speak. Now, some other considerations in terms of questions. Does the subject matter of a story benefit the reporter, the manager, or the station? Would members of the audience perceive a story is done for the monetary benefit of the station or any of its employees? And so if the subject matter, it's a, it, you know, subject matter is about the person's business or you're doing it as a pseudo ad, then of course, audience members will say, this is really a sales pitch. This is not something, this is not a story that has news value. So ethically speaking, you know, reporters have got to consider, reporters and their journalists, um, their, their editors have got to consider how it is that they're actually covering that story and whether it's within the interest of the audience or whether it's actually to benefit um, the station or its employees, some sort of promise that you've received if you're carrying a particular story. If so, if you're carrying that story for benefits, uh, is there another source or approach for the story that would eliminate that potential conflict of interest? Another consideration, will you accept free travel from sources? Most journalists will accept a ride in a pickup truck to the local farmer's pumpkin patch, but will they also accept a free ride on an airline showing off a new route? All right. So if you're doing that, it means that you're a travel writer. Perhaps you've got to give them some mileage in terms of the coverage and what if you have to do that what's the expectation in terms of the competition that is out there will your particular coverage be biased of course it's an ethical consideration in terms of the freebies and the expectation on the part of the person or the airline that has given you that free flight journalists and managers should also consider whether they will accept free transportation too um you know and in what form and, uh, you know, whether the station insists on buying tickets to those forms of transportation that require passengers to do the same. How will you divulge to your audience that you have taken, um, you know, taken the free transportation? So it's this whole notion of is there a conflict of interest and should the public know, should they be aware that I've actually taken the free ride or it's a part of a promotion? They need to know in some cases. Will you disclose connections further on? Um, between the owners of your station and the sources are subjects of stories. The corporate ownership of most television and radio station, um, you know, this particular ownership produces conflicts of interest in the area of business and finance. And so managers need to consider whether or not to disclose ownership relationship when covering stories about companies with common or connected ownership. And the next question is, how will the connections above be inserted in the story? Or whether they should be inserted at all? In the introduction, the tag, both are in some other way. Will you say that this particular news item, this segment is sponsored by, or we want to say many thanks to Sprint, or to Verizon, or we want to say thanks to Nike, you know, for sponsoring this segment, or for, for giving us, you know, um, our platform, whatever it is. So managers really need to examine the proper place to run disclaimers of ownership and other possible conflicts of interest, which properly inform the audience about the connection, but do not create perceptions of conflict of interest 
where they do not exist. Now, finally, if an employee commits a violation of the station's rules regarding conflict of interest, will that violation be disclosed to the public? If so, how will the violation be disclosed? Aside from the station's personnel policies for disciplining the employee, managers should consider how violation would be perceived if the public found out and consider whether to make that information part of follow-up or continuing coverage of the story. Now, again, we come back to that case that I introduced at the top of this lecture. If the case of Chris Cuomo represents a violation of the rules regarding conflict of interest, should the public have a right to know? And of course, everyone, you know, uh, most audience members, they were aware that they were brothers. So this was no disclosure that CNN was expected to come up with, but they were expected to come up with the answers as they pertain to ethical breaches. And this is why he was able to apologize quickly to try to save his job, which could not have occurred in the final analysis, and he was let go eventually. All right? So it's this whole notion of are there policies? Are you going to take the person off here as a result of a breach or a violation of the particular regulation regarding the conduct of how that reporter would go about doing the job as it relates to um, breaching the violation in terms of the coverage of the story. Other considerations for us to ponder, will newsroom personnel be allowed to moonlight with interests that may be the subject of news coverage? If there is a news item, that is really um, framed as an active investigation should a reporter be allowed to actually be seen out publicly with that particular person who is on their investigation. And so the question of whether on-air personalities can do commercial appearances or voice over work is also part of this whole notion of how are we crossing the line or whether we are actually, you know, removing boundaries as it relates to moonlighting with different interests. Many stations have arrangements that actually allow newsroom personnel to work elsewhere, meaning they, they can hold multiple roles, but managers really need to ask themselves, what sort of conflicts of interest are we creating that might be perceived from such relationships? For instance, can a sportscaster also broadcast games for a local team on its payroll? Can a sportscaster work for ESPN and work for you know, CNN at the same time, can they work across multiple spaces and news establishments all at the same time? Now, many journalists see it as their duty to take part in public service work. And so the question is, does that work present any conflicts of interest? The RTDNA guidelines on, or, you know, this whole notion of, you know, on air charitable solicitations may be of some sort of help to, 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 us in this particular regard. Um, questions pertaining to whether the station has a policy on if and how employees can participate in political campaigns. These are questions that have to be asked as well, ethically speaking, and whether journalists and their managers are treated differently on the policy than other station employees is also another question. Simply because journalists will face scrutiny um, of those looking for political bias in their coverage especially if the station is known to be um, a partisan station or one that has really, um, uh, you know, putting themselves out there as being the most balanced um, people who will bring you the news. Now, voting, I should say voting is a private act, but public participation in political events, campaign contributions, or personal messages of support on private time have absolutely no place in the life of most journalists. In my last lecture, I alluded to the fact that journalists have been engaged in moderating debates. That is fine, but they should not be telling people, the audience, how to actually vote. And so stations should really develop a very specific list of what political activity is never acceptable for their journalists or other employees within their purview. Other considerations yet again to ponder, is there a system in place to allow journalists and managers to recuse themselves from editorial decisions about stories from which a conflict of interest really perceived may arise. And again, questions of whether reporters and editors have a clear picture of what constitutes a large enough call for their withdrawal from a story, a large enough conflict, that is, to call for a withdrawal. 
all right? So managers really need to take the time to consider the inevitable conflicts that may arise and discuss how to deal with them before the conflict actually emerges as a thing, as a news item. Finally, is there a whistleblower system in the newsroom that allows anyone to point out possible conflicts of interest so that management can act on them? Is the review of all work for possible conflicts of interest a regular part of newsroom culture? Or do they have a culture that says if it bleeds, it bleeds. We don't care how you get the story. Once you get the story, we don't care that it's your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your grandma. Just get the story. What is in place, so to speak, within that particular culture of the newsroom that speaks to we are going to actually remove the conflict before it occurs, all right? Um, you can actually blow the whistle without being reprimanded. If that is not the case as part of the culture, then there's a problem there in that particular news establishment when it comes to the ethical decision making. Now, today's case study, you should note, it applies to the issue of competing loyalties. Um, we see that in a newspaper, but loyalty really will arise in all media professions, whether it's radio, television, newspaper, online. Later this semester, we'll talk about competing loyalties for PR and advertising professionals. So I'd like you to continue to read those case studies with a view to really examining exactly what is happening um, in the context of how ethics is breached across the divide when it comes to how it is journalists and their editors make decisions pertaining to how they're covering the news, who is actually a source, and who should actually be covering the story as part of their beat. Please remember to actually read your case studies ahead and look through chapter four as we progress the semester looking at ethics.